We'll see what'll happen. I don't know. Are y'all all right tonight? You good? Yeah. Well, we might change that. I don't know. Um, so here's the thing. People who know about my work, and I know most of y'all do, or you wouldn't, you wouldn't be here since you weren't bribed. You're here of your own volition. Um, you probably have some recognition of the fact that I am not known for my sunny optimism. This is an understatement of somewhat biblical proportions, but there it is in any event. Um, I'm not cynical. I'm not. I'm trying not to be at least, but um, I'm not known for my rosy disposition about the state of the world or particularly the state of this country. So um, in spite of that, however, in spite of the fact that that's not my normal default position, I am trying, I really am, I'm trying to be as optimistic as I can be and tease out the positives out of a moment in our history as a country and as a people that is quite problematic, again, to say the least, again, an understatement of somewhat biblical proportions. And so for the last year, at least, I've been trying to figure out what's the silver lining in this year? Yeah, it's hard, it's hard. And not because this year is particularly unique in a lot of ways, but because the, um, the obviousness with which we have to confront the problems of our country are perhaps clearer now. And so for about a year, I've been trying to figure out how do I spin this in a way that doesn't create total cynicism in my own children, who are 16 and 14, and in young people to whom I speak all around the country. Um, and here's what I've come up with, and I gotta be honest, like, I don't even know how strong this is. Like, to be honest, I'm not even sure I believe my own bullshit, okay? Like, I could be completely naive about this, but I'm just gonna, I'm gonna throw it out there and you can determine if it makes any sense. But here's the best I can do in this moment. The silver lining in the otherwise incredibly problematic storm clouds of the current moment in American history. And in order to give you the silver lining, I have to back up for just a second and make an obvious point. For the last eight years, those of us who do racial justice work and racial equity work have been on a particular mission where we had one job, to be honest, like this was our job for the last eight years of the presidency of Barack Obama. Our job as anti-racist was to actually convince white people that racism was still a thing. That was our gig for eight years because a lot of white folks were like, oh my God, it's so cool that racism is over. <laughs> because that black guy got elected and I totally voted for him. <laughs> Which first of all, no you didn't because the majority of white people never voted for Barack Obama, but um, oh my God, it's so cool, racism's over. Which I'm sure the women in the room will recall that day in 1988 when patriarchy was smashed in Pakistan. <laughs> and you didn't even let me finish the line. Don't, <laughs> don't bite the bars before I finish them, please. Like, like when, pa when patriarchy was smashed in Pakistan because Benazir Bhutto, a woman, was elected head of state, right, in Pakistan. You do remember that, women, right? Like all of you were thinking, holy hell, I need to move to Pakistan because things are good for women. They have a woman who's the head of state, right? Nobody did that. Like even my child at the time, who didn't even exist and wouldn't exist for another 13 years, knew even like 13 years before her birth, like the election of a woman in Pakistan didn't mean anything about the eradication of male supremacy and domination in, in Pakistan. So, but in this country, that's what we assumed about Barack Obama. White folks were like, oh my God, I'm so glad we don't have to talk about that. <laughs> so for eight years, that was our gig, trying to just hold white folks' hands. My people, my people, my people and convince them that racism was really a thing. Now, however exhausting that that bullshit was for me, I can't even fathom how exhausting that was for the black and brown folks in this room who had to go back to like, like reality 101 with some white folks, like, right? And yet that was the gig. So here's the, I, but I told you I was trying to tease the positive out of the negative, so here comes the positive. And like I said, I'm not saying this is persuasive. I'm just giving you the best I got, trying to find the silver lining. The good news is, for the last eight years, we've been having to hold people's hand and prove that racism was a real thing. The good news is, I guess we don't have to do that shit anymore. Yeah, like I said, it's not real persuasive because 
if the best evidence you have that things are good is the fact that things are more blatant now, if the best evidence you have that things are good is that middle school children are taunting other middle school children who happen to be Latinx with chants of build the wall, build the wall, if the best evidence you have that things are better is that things are blatant because nationalists, of white nationalists and neo-Nazis and white supremacists are running over people in Charlottesville, the best evidence you have that things are better because they're more blatant and therefore more obvious is that we have multiple hate crimes, murders happening in New York and in College Park, Maryland and all across this country in Kansas, right? And you've got a dude walking into the Walmart in Thornton, which is how far from here? Not far. And shooting up Latinx folks. They didn't even report that the first three days after the crime. They didn't even tell you that, that he targeted Latinx folks and actually shot them on purpose and had a history of abusing Latinx folks in his apartment complex, wherever the hell it was he lived, that he was actually openly hostile to them. They didn't tell you that in between the dude in New York who happens to be Muslim and ran over folks with his truck. We heard about that. And we ascribe that to his religion. This dude, Scott Ostrom, they tell you finally in the reports had stacks of Bibles in his house. No furniture, but stacks of Bibles. A futon and a bunch of Bibles. Now if it was a stack of Korans, I have a feeling that we'd have been having a different conversation in this country about Scott Ostrom. But you can have a stack of Bibles and be a white man and go and shoot Latinx folks and they don't call it a, even to call it a hate crime, let alone an act of terrorism. See, that's the country in which we live and that is not even in my notes, but it needed to be said. And so, it's not really a silver lining, is it? Because if the silver lining is things are more blatant now and now we can't really ignore it, but people have to die in order for us to not ignore it. That's not really progress. But at least it does tell us one thing. If you can't see it now, you're never gonna see it. And I can't waste my time on you. And I can't bother with trying to convert you. At some point, you're gonna have to have your own come to Jesus moment before you realize the evidence right in front of you that black and brown folks have been trying to tell all of us in the white community forever and that we've been ignoring because if you cannot see it now, you are not gonna see it. And the rest of us have to move on without you and build a movement without you. And you'll either join up or you won't. You'll either figure it out or you won't. But there comes a point where we cannot pander to those who can't even see the obviousness in front of them. There comes a point where we have to treat people like adults and tell them to act like such and not as children, despite their age, and act as though we have an obligation to show them the light. The light is real clear for those who are willing to open their eyes, so we just have to do our work. You know? But here's what really concerns me. And this is actually a bigger concern than all of that which I just said. I'm really concerned that when we have this resurgence of overt bigotry that we can all look around and that we can see, it makes it especially easy for the rest of us in the white community. I don't mean the racist overtly. I don't mean the white supremacist. I don't mean the neo-Nazis. I mean the nice white liberal folks for what that's worth. And I've been white a long time, so let me assure you, it is worth nothing. It allows those of us who are nice white liberals to separate ourselves from those folks, right? It allows us to claim distance from them. It allows us to say, thank God we're not like those people in Charlottesville. Thank God we're not like David Duke. We're not like Richard Spencer. We're not like Matt Heimbach. We're not like Andrew Anglin. We're not like those dudes in Charlottesville marching around with their tiki torches. Because, you know, nothing says white supremacy like white boys walking around with oversized Polynesian candles trying to be badass. Nothing is more badass than that. And wearing polo shirts and khakis, because that's intimidating as hell. Right? But see, we like to, and I just made fun of them because it was fun to do, but we don't need to separate ourselves from them. When white liberal and progressive people do that, we actually become part of the problem. Right? This idea that, oh my God, thank God we're not like them. Those are the racist white people and we're the good white people. But here's what I know for a fact. David Duke and Richard Spencer 
and Matt Heimbach and Andrew Anglin and those boys in Charlottesville, I'll tell you what they're not to blame for. They might be to blame for the murder of Heather Heyer in Charlottesville, but I'll tell you what they're not to blame for. They're not to blame for the fact that right now the typical white family in America has 12 times the net worth of the typical, white fa of typical black family in America. They're not to blame for that. They're not to blame for the fact that the typical white family has 10 times the net worth of the typical Latinx family. They're not to blame for that. That's about history and the accumulated advantage of some and the disadvantage of others. And David Duke wasn't in a position to make that happen. Richard Spencer wasn't in a position to make that happen. They're not to blame for the fact that black households headed by college graduates have less wealth on average by about one third than white households headed by a high school dropout. Let me repeat that. That black households headed by a college graduate have one third less wealth than white households headed by somebody that didn't even finish 12th grade. So tell me again the piece about how education is the great equalizer, please. And how, and how if black folks just valued education enough and did what they were supposed to do and played by the rules, they would be at the same level as white people. Tell me that again while you reflect on that data which nobody's told you until tonight. Nobody running for office, nobody asking for your vote has told you that. But that's the truth, and David Duke didn't do it. Richard Spencer didn't do it. Matt Heimbach didn't do it. Andrew Anglin didn't do it. The Klan didn't do it. They're not to blame for the fact that right now, unarmed black folks, 3.2 times more likely than unarmed white folks to be shot by police, even when they are not aggressing against the officers. That's not David Duke. He didn't have a badge and a gun. It's not Richard Spencer. He doesn't have a badge and a gun. That's just average everyday white folks on police forces around this country and black folks unarmed 3.2 times more likely to be shot by police than white folks. See, that's on us. That's not on them. That's on us because we've remained silent in the face of that black death and that brown death. We've remained silent. We haven't done enough. We haven't said enough. We like to put it on Nazis, though, because we're not Nazis. Thank God we're not Nazis. We're smart enough to not vote for Nazis. If the best thing you can say for yourself is that you know better than to vote for Nazis, you need to start over again. Right? The best thing that we can say about ourselves is that we're good enough not to be white nationalists marching with tiki torches in Charlottesville defending Confederate statues. We need to start over again because these problems are systemic and they got nothing to do with Nazis. They have to do with us. They have to do with our neighbors, they have to do with our family, they have to do with our colleagues and our friends and people that we know and live around. And they might have to do with us. David Duke and Richard Spencer are not to blame for the fact that right now black folks are 13% of drug users but 37% of people arrested and incarcerated for a drug offense. That's not on David Duke. They're not to blame for the fact that right now in the state of Colorado, y'all got some white folks getting rich. Real rich. Real rich. Selling the same product on the same block. On the same block that black and brown folks were selling the same product on 10 years ago and they're still doing time right now in prisons in this state. David Duke didn't cause that. But you got some white meat weed millionaires making money selling the same product and doing it with like <laughs> tasting notes and shit. <laughs> Why the hell you need tasting notes with your weed? What the hell? I don't. Why you like notes of apricot and shit? Like, <laughs> why can't you just smoke weed? Like, just. Don't tell me what kind of cheese to pair my weed with. I don't need to pair weed with cheese. I got Cheetos, that's all I need to pair my weed with. How the hell did white people gentrify weed? Like, it's bad enough you gentrified the neighborhood, then you just like gentrified the product. You're like, watch this. And that's not in the notes either, but I mean, honest to God, right? So 
David Duke's not to blame for that disparity. David Duke's not to blame for any of that. Richard Spencer's not to blame for any of that. And I didn't need any of that data, by the way, that I just shared with you to tell me that the war on drugs wasn't about drugs. I could have told you that from personal experience, and I can tell you this now because the statute of limitations has expired, <laughs> and they cannot touch me. So 30 years ago, I'm coming back from a, I was in college at Tulane in New Orleans, and I'm coming back from a uh, college debate tournament that was held in San Antonio, driving back in a rental car from San Antonio to New Orleans. And uh, I get stopped for speeding about 13 miles over the speed limit in Gonzales, Texas. I don't recommend this, by the way. I don't know if you've been to Gonzales. Like, uh, one person is like, oh, hell, I know where you're. I know where this story's going. <laughs> Holy hell, Gonzalez, Jesus, this is gonna be terrible. Um, I get stopped in Gonzalez, and the uh, officer comes to the, and I'm nervous, because I'm nervous because um, a couple of reasons. Number one is nobody likes getting stopped by cops. Like, even white people, we don't like it. We know it's different than black and brown folks, but like, we don't like it either. Like, nobody likes getting stopped by the cop, because you know, for white people, they might actually give you a ticket. Obviously, for black and brown folks, the concern is quite a bit more than that. But nonetheless, we're still nervous as hell, right? So I'm nervous, but I'm specifically nervous because I know what's in the car. And I don't mean debate evidence, right? It's me and my debate partner and then another two-person team in the coach, five people in the rental car. And I know that in the briefcase of the coach, <laughs> is two and a half ounces of weed. Oh, it gets worse. Two and a half ounces of weed, an eight ball of cocaine, 12 sheets of acid, and 16 hits of ecstasy. Y'all think about that for a minute. For those of you, I like how every time I tell this story, though, what's funny, literally every time I tell this story, there are white folks in the audience who are like, oh, yeah. Oh, hell yeah. Like, they're really excited for me. Like, I'm carrying on me tonight. Like, <laughs> y'all, this shit was 30 years ago. Settle down. Like, this is not, and my asthma came back, so I don't do this anymore. Like, this is an old story, so just settle down. Y'all got weed chops? Just take care of yourself. I got nothing for you. But anyway, we got a lot of drugs in the car, and if y'all don't know about illegal narcotics and you don't understand what all those references were and how much drugs that really is, like, let me just assure you, Whatever you understand about personal consumption, yeah, that's way more than you could possibly consume. So that's enough that if they catch you with it, you will go down for possession with intent to distribute. Trust me. So I'm nervous because they pulled me over, and I know that's what's in the car. And so the cop comes to the window, and he says, uh, I need to see your license and registration. I'm like, well, it's a rental car. Here's the registration information, and uh, I'll get my license. And so I pull my wallet out, and I'm looking for it. I can't find it having a hell of a time finding my, I can't find it. And it's mostly because I'm nervous and I'm starting to sweat. It's been like four seconds <laughs> since he came to the window and I'm already like, oh my God, oh my God. And it felt like it took three weeks. It probably was like a minute and a half at most, right? But it felt like it was three weeks and I cannot find my license. And at one point he says, uh, so do you want to come back to the uh, police cruiser and try to find it there? The light's better there. <laughs> and I'm thinking, I don't really want to go back there, but... Uh, <laughs> You've offered it, and I guess I'm going, so yeah, I'll go. And my voice cracked like I was 13 and going through puberty again. So I go back, I'm nervous as hell. He can obviously tell I'm nervous. I go and sit in his car. By the way, if you've never had the pleasure of sitting in the front of a police cruiser, uh, he was right, the lighting is way better in there. <laughs> they can see every damn thing in there. And I'm sitting there trying to find my license and I still can't find it. I keep looking and I keep looking and I keep looking and I cannot find it and I'm obviously fumbling, and I'm obviously nervous, and, but I turn the little plastic you know, things that you keep your credit cards and stuff in, and at one point, I, but I do come across my fake ID, because that's important. <laughs> and he sees it, and he goes, isn't that it? And I'm like, no, no! <laughs> I don't know what that is, I have no idea. That's like an arts and crafts project or some shit that I did for fun, for extra credit. I don't know what, even though it said Maine driver's license on it, the reason it said Maine as in the state of Maine, driver's license, is uh, that we were in Louisiana and we figured nobody knows what the hell a Maine driver's license even 
even looks like, so we can just make this up, <laughs> and nobody's going to know that it's fake, you know? But he looked at it, he said, isn't that it? I'm like, no, 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 no. And he starts to reach for it. And just as he starts to reach for it, I find the actual Tennessee license, and I pull it out, and I, here it is. And he goes, are you sure that's the one you want to go with? And I said, yeah, I'm really sure this is, the, this is definitely the one. I'd like to stick with this one. Thank you. Yes, I'm totally going to stick with this one. Thank you, if that's okay. And he goes, that's fine. And he writes a number down. And he issues me a $75 ticket, and he sends me on my way. Now, if you believe that that would have worked out that way, if I had been black or brown in Gonzales, Texas, or anywhere in this country, in 1987 or yesterday, you are not paying attention. And I do not mean to this lecture. I mean to life in your country. Because in fact, if I had displayed that level of nervousness, if I had demonstrated very clearly in his presence a fake ID that his comment signifies he knew was fake, that's why he asked me if I wanted to go with that one versus the other one. If you think that a person of color would have been treated the same way, you're not paying attention, which is my long way of telling you that the only reason I'm standing in front of you today and the only reason that you know who in the hell I am is because of white privilege and the institutional racism. <laughs> and the institutional racism of the drug war because otherwise I did hard time for at least 20 years, if not still today, in the state of Texas for drug possession with intent to distribute. So that's an important thing to note when we think about crime and fear and who we fear and who we don't fear and where we are as a country. And none of that is about David Duke. And none of that is about guys that burn crosses in the night. None of that's about guys that wear swastikas on their sleeve. And none of that's about skinheads. That's about a culture that we as a society haven't done enough to eradicate that is run by people who are by and large at least overtly appalled by those people I just mentioned, and yet they do the bidding of them every day. And we need to be clear about that. It's not white nationalists, at least not in the overt sense, who are attacking those football players who are taking a knee peacefully on Sundays. That's just average everyday white folks, isn't it? That's just average folks. And I didn't intend to speak about this, but about six weeks ago, I realized I had no choice because I started to realize that this whole thing that's going on with the NFL and the reaction from some quarters of the white community to what is going on with these protests is like the perfect metaphor for the racial divide in this country. You cannot get any more perfect than this. This actually is a metaphor for the whole history of the divide between white folks and people of color in this country. Because what you have is people of color raising their voice against demonstrable injustice, provable injustice, injustice for which there's no rebuttal. And then you got white folks saying, y'all have lost your mind and you're upsetting my day. <laughs> which is exactly what white folks said when the sit-ins hit Nashville, where I'm from. I know because my grandmother was one of them. My mom's mom was one of them. She wasn't a bigot. She was never one of those white people that would have yelled at black children as they were integrating a formerly all-white school. That would have been tacky. <laughs> and if there was one thing that white women in the early 1960s in the South valued, it was class. So she would never have been one of those white people, but she was the kind of white person that when the sit-in struck in Nashville two weeks after they began in Greensboro on Feb 4 or Feb 1 of 1960, Two weeks later, they hit Nashville, and her thing is, oh, I wanted to go shopping downtown, but I'm not going to be able to now. Why do they have to do this? If I go shopping, there might be a riot. Oh, my God, when am I going to get to go shopping again? It's just the inconvenience of it all. You know, it's just the inconvenience of raising issues of injustice. My God, why do you have to put us out? Well, because... If protest doesn't inconvenience you, it's not working. That's sort of the point. So when you say some stupid shit like, I just want to watch the game on Sunday. Why can't I just watch the game? I just want to watch the game. Ansley Earhart, who actually makes other Fox News hosts look intelligent. She actually said this like 
two weeks ago, she says, I just want to I just want to eat pizza and popcorn and watch football. First of all, like upgrade your Sunday food. <laughs> First of all, like like if what you're eating during the game is football and I mean like pizza and popcorn, what the hell? Like do better. First of all, like just on a on a pure snack level, like come on, like bet do, come on, like but beyond that, like, what does that mean? It's just a white person whining about how black folks are putting her out, reminding her of stuff she doesn't be reminded of at a time when she doesn't want to be reminded of it. This is the whole history of America, is black folks raising issues and white folks saying there isn't really a problem. Y'all are seeing things. That's the perfect metaphor. This isn't about the flag. It's not about the national anthem. Although if you know the history of the national anthem, it damn well ought to be about the national anthem. If you actually knew the history of that song and you still wanted to sing it, there's a problem with you. Because Francis Scott Key was a vicious white supremacist and defender of slavery. And the third verse of that song, which none of y'all learned growing up, I didn't learn it growing up, they didn't teach it to us, but it was in the song until the 1920s, until they finally took it out, because it didn't quite sound right. right. The third verse of that song is a revenge fantasy a white supremacist revenge fantasy in theory against the British, because that song was written during the War of 1812 after the Battle of Fort McHenry in Baltimore, but in, in actual language, you read the lyrics, it's a revenge fantasy against black folks enslaved who were insufficiently patriotic and sided with the British because the British said, if you fight for us, we'll free you. And in Maryland, they weren't gonna do that. So when black folks weren't sufficiently patriotic in defending a system that enslaved them, Francis Scott Key fantasized in the third verse about the blood of slaves running in the streets of Baltimore. That's the history of that song. So even though that's not what the football players are protesting, it damn well ought to be what we're protesting every single day because as a national song, that's a pathetic excuse for an anthem. But that's not what they're, they're not complaining about the military. Good Lord, what kind of, what kind of ignorance does it take to believe these are protests about the military? Well, let's think about it. I mean, these are people that are protesting, and Colin Kaepernick told you why he was doing it. Everybody's told you. It's about inequality in the justice system, which is to say it's about the disparate treatment of black folks in the justice system in particular, which is a direct violation of this little thing in the Constitution called the 14th Amendment, the Equal Protection Clause of that amendment, which is to say not only is this protest not disrespecting the military, keep in mind who the soldiers actually took a pledge and actual took an oath to defend. They didn't take an oath to defend the flag. No soldier ever died for a flag. If you think soldiers died for the flag, you're a sucker and so were they. They didn't die for a flag. They didn't die for a song. They actually take an oath to the Constitution of the United States. That's the only only thing that they actually pledge any oath to. So that means that not only are the soldiers not disrespecting them, but that any soldier who took their oath seriously would take a knee with them every week to actually protest the inequalities of the justice system. And if you're not willing, if you're a soldier that's not willing to take a knee on behalf of the Constitution, then please do not lecture the rest of us about how we're disrespecting your service. You took an oath, defend it. But see, we can't hear that. White America writ large, I'm not talking about every white person. I want to be clear now. I'm talking about white America writ large as a corporate entity. Because you know we're a corporate entity. We have, we have incorporation papers and shit. Like it's a real formal thing. White America is a formal thing. Not all white folks are bought into it and some people of color are. But I'm just saying, that's true now. It's true. White supremacy is a system that works on the colonized. You don't just colonize people's lands, you colonize their minds. So white supremacy can work on anybody, right? Mostly works on my folks, but it can work on other people. There are women that internalize sexism and misogyny, right? There are LGBTQ folks that internalize straight supremacy and cisgendered supremacy. There are poor folks who hate themselves for being poor, right? It's not just about the dominant group internalizing superiority. It's about marginalized groups internalizing their own inferiority. So it happens. But my point is, 
that we don't, by and large, particularly in the white community, want to hear any of this because to us, we can't see through the lens of black and brown America. We can't understand that, and this is the metaphor of the NFL protest, it's about white folks not being able to see the reality that people of color live. So when black folks take that knee on Sunday, it's like, how dare you? That doesn't even make sense to us. And especially because you're a spoiled millionaire that makes all this money. Because white folks really don't like it when black folks make more money than us. In case y'all hadn't noticed, we have a real problem with that. We have no problem with white folks that make more money than us because we think eventually we're going to be them. So if Colin Kaepernick has an $11 million contract, which he had last year, he doesn't have it now. But he had an $11 million contract and folks lost their mind. How dare he? Ungrateful. Find another country where you could make $11 million throwing a ball around. Okay. And Donald Trump, find another country where you <laughs> could, could take over a real estate portfolio worth $237 million from your daddy in the early 1980s when property in New York was cheap and the city was bankrupt. Find another country where you could inherit that kind of wealth and become a billionaire, please. And when you find that country, feel free to move to it because <laughs> there is no such place. But we, but we, don't, but we, don't, but we, don't, we don't make the same judgment for him. See, white folks can criticize America. Black folks cannot. Patriotism is for black people. Did y'all not know that? Patriotism is for people of color. Patriotism is what people of color have to show just to be appreciative of all they've been given. That's what folks said when these protests struck off. All that we've given you. And then folks were like, y'all are just ungrateful. You, all you do is play ball. Well, all y'all do is buy tickets to see us play ball. So at some point, <laughs> feel free to stop buying tickets. Stop buying jerseys. Stop going to the games or play the damn game yourself and see if anybody comes to see your pathetic ass throw a ball around and run down the field. But when white folks complain about America, white people can actually make a whole campaign slogan and a pretty little hat that's based on a criticism of America. Because when I make a hat that says, make America great again, did I not just pretty much tell you that my opinion of America is that it sucks right now? Like, that's pretty much the implicit message of that hat. The message is America sucks and needs to be made great again because right now it's terrible. If a black person were to say that, if a brown person were to say that, if a person of color of any kind were to say that, folks would call them unpatriotic, ungrateful, hateful, tell them to find another country. A white dude says that and white folks will make them president. That tells you all you need to know about this country. But that's the whole metaphor of race in America. People of color say something's wrong, and white folks are like, y'all are seeing things. We don't understand what you're talking about. My goodness, we can't even get our head around it. And if this were just a common, like, modern phenomena, maybe we could write it off to mere ignorance. People just don't know, right? And I get it. Like, I get it if you're, like, 17 or something, and you just haven't really been exposed to the reality of this. I can understand your, your, your ignorance, but see, there's a difference between ignorance just like in the formal sense, right? Ignorance in like the grammatical, just formal definitional sense of that word is just not knowing some stuff, right? And when you're just ignorant about some stuff, it's no big deal. Like if I give you some information that fills in the gaps of your knowledge about stuff you don't know, there's no reason to get pissy about it. You just go, oh my gosh, that was really, I appreciate you helping me out with that. I, I didn't understand. Like I'm ignorant about like physics and stuff calculus, all kinds of math beyond like seventh grade, you know. <laughs> so if you like told me how to do like calculus really easily, I would be so appreciative. I'd be like, oh my God, <laughs> I had no idea it was that easy. Thank you. Oddly enough, when you tell people about white supremacy and its reality in America, they don't thank your ass for that. They don't actually go like, oh my God, thank you for filling in the gaps of my information. <laughs> they get angry. Because this isn't a new phenomenon. This is intergenerational, right? The idea that white folks can't hear this black and brown truth, it's an intergenerational thing. So you can go back to the early 60s, 1961, when the freedom rides and the sit-ins were in full swing. Now, this is stuff that, in retrospect, we look back on, and we think of those people as some of the greatest freedom fighters in the history of this country, don't we? Like, they're, they're secular saints now. We look back at the Freedom Riders and 
we look back at the sit-in activist and we look back at Dr. King and we look back at all these folks and we, we view them as secular saints. But in 1961, when polls were taken, 70% of white Americans said the sit-ins and the freedom riders were doing the wrong thing and their actions were gonna be more hurtful than helpful and they were unnecessary. That's what 70% of white folks said. 70% of white folks were like, there's no need for this. It's messing up my day. In 1962, they asked, Gallup asked white folks, do you think black children have the same chance to get a good education as white children? Come on, it's 62, y'all. The answer is no. It's real easy. In retrospect, nobody would get this question wrong. But in 1962, 85 out of 100 white folks answered yes. 85% of white folks were like, oh yeah, everything's fine. 1963, Gallup asked white folks, do you think blacks are treated equally in your community in housing, education, and employment? Again, it's 1963, y'all. This is not a hard quiz. This is not difficult, this is not the GRE, this is some real basic American history shit. And in retrospect, we all know the answer is no, of course black folks weren't being treated equally. The Civil Rights Act hadn't even been passed yet, the Voting Rights Act hadn't been passed yet, the Fair Housing Act was five years away from being passed, it's the high water mark of the movement, it's the year of the March on Washington, it's the year that Medgar Evers gets shot down dead in his driveway in Jackson, it's the year that George Wallace stands in the schoolhouse door at the University of Alabama and says segregation today, segregation tomorrow, segregation forever. It's the high watermark of American apartheid. And when white folks were asked, do you think blacks are treated equally, two thirds of us said, of course, everything is fine. So what do I make of it? See, because I think most of those white folks were decent people in spite of their ignorance. I think they were mostly decent folks. I don't think they were hateful people, mostly bigoted people. I think they were mostly decent people, but the fact is decent people caught up in iniquitous systems get twisted and don't understand the reality in which they live. And so as a result, the vast majority of white folks, despite their best intentions, didn't see what was obvious. Now, here's the thing. If white folks didn't see it in 61 and didn't see it in 62 and didn't see it in 63, why in the hell would I trust white people and why should you trust white folks to tell you when racism exist in 2017. Why in the hell would you do that? Because any white person that questions the reality of racism in 2017 reminds me of their parents and their grandparents who said the same thing when it was blatant. People of color have always seen it and they've always been right. White folks have never seen it and we've always been wrong. And I have a hard time believing that suddenly we figured it all out and black and brown folks lost their mind. I have a hard time believing that's what happened. But when these black folks take a knee, that's basically what we're saying. What are you complaining about? What in the world are you complaining about? But it's the very same thing that was said. There's never been any point where white America endorsed black protest. Not one time in this country's history can you point to a time when white folks on the whole believed that black protest was justified, even in the 60s when now, in 1966, Gallup did a poll where they asked white folks what they thought about black protest and Literally, like 75% of white folks said that if they were black in America, they wouldn't be protesting anymore by 1966. <laughs> this coming from people that lost their mind over some taxes on tea, y'all. <laughs> white folks were like, you taxed our tea. No damn way we're dumping that shit in the harbor and we're starting a revolution. But if y'all are lynching us and like, denying our equal right, no, we're not gonna protest that, but some tea taxes, oh no, hell no. Right? I mean, this is ridiculous, right? But this is sort of where we're at. And I just want us to think about what it means that white America by and large has never been able to see. It's also about, I think, important to understand that this Manipulation of white public opinion around the NFL protests is also part of a political strategy. And let's be very clear about that. There's a reason this is what Donald Trump keeps talking about. There was an article in Politico just a couple days ago, y'all ought to read it. It's about, there was a reporter that went to Pennsylvania, went to Western PA, right, and started interviewing Trump voters about how they felt a year out. And you know, here's the thing, like most people, it doesn't matter who you voted for. Like most people, you could be liberal, you could be conservative, you could be a Democrat, you could be a Republican, you could be anything else. Most people will never admit they screwed up. 
right? It's just a psychological thing. Like, most people just aren't going to do it. Like, you know, it's not just those folks. Like, most of us are just not going to do it. Like, somebody that we voted for could totally start a war and we'd act like it hadn't happened. Like, that's honest to God. That's the truth. The psychology of it is we just don't admit when we mess, when we mess up because then we have to own the mistake and it's hard. And so I get it. But anyway, the political reporter goes out to Western PA, goes to Johnstown, which is outside of Pittsburgh. And he's talking to these folks, like multiple generations in the, in the mining industry or whatever. And he asks them sort of how things are a year later and they're like, oh, everything sucks. Oh, it's a shithole. Like we're just, we're still in the same position we were in a year ago, nothing's really changed. Everything's horrible. And he's like, oh, well then you must like put that on the president, right? Oh no, 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 it's not the president. No, we still support the president 100%. And he goes through this whole process of how that is, right? And really, what you, you should read the article. I mean, I'm going to summarize it, but essentially, you listen to what they say. And it's rather obvious that what they find endearing about this president, they, they say things like, well, I just like the fact, you know, that what he's doing on immigration. And the reporter says, well, he, he hasn't built the wall, and he's not going to build the wall. It's not really going to happen. He's like, I don't even give a shit if he builds the wall. It's just the fact that, he's, that he knows they don't belong here. Right? So it's more about the pose than the actual policy. It's more about saying... They don't belong. It's more about finding an enemy and reminding people who the enemy is than actually getting anything done. So they all say, well, like, he hasn't brought any jobs back. It's like, I didn't expect him to. Oh, but they told us that's why you voted for him was because of economic anxiety and the need for jobs. That's what they told us. He's like, well, we didn't expect him to really bring jobs back. We know we're never going to get those jobs back. Coal jobs aren't coming back, right? But at one point, the most ubiquitous thing that these folks said, the reporter says, is that it was about the NFL protest. It was about this idea that this was symbolic for them of something bigger than anything that would actually improve their lives. Just having a president who pointed to an enemy and said, that's who you should hate because they make millions of dollars and you don't. And they make millions of dollars just playing a game. Imagine that. And y'all are struggling to survive. And it was just that attitude. It was just the, basically, essentially what these folks were acknowledging was that their entire vote for this man was about flipping off people they didn't like. It was the political equivalent of a ball grab. Right? It's about guys just grabbing, you know, you know what I mean. Right? And saying, F all y'all. That's basically what this is. And they all but said it. So when he starts talking about NFL players, he knows exactly what he's doing. We can make fun of him on Twitter, and we can talk about why don't you just do your job and do stuff, but the fact is he's doing what he thinks his job is, and it's the oldest play in the playbook of this country, which is rich white people telling not rich white people that their enemies are black and brown. Because that is the oldest play in the book. That's not new. People act like this is some unprecedented stuff. You'll hear people say that. You'll hear liberal folks say that. My God, this is, we've never seen anything like this. This is unprecedented. And black folks are like, have y'all been paying attention to like, if y'all saw that SNL sketch like the week after the election, y'all remember when Chris Rock came back and Dave Chappelle hosted and they did that sketch with those, like, those white people and they had their one black friend who was Dave Chappelle, of course, because if you had one black friend, it would be Dave Chappelle. And... And, and they were in the Brooklyn flat watching the returns. You remember this sketch? And there was like, the white folks were just confident. They were just like, we got this, we got this. Hillary Clinton is gonna be the first female president. It's a great night. And Chappelle's like, yeah, it's gonna be an interesting night. <laughs> because Dave Chappelle's character knew something about this country that his white friends didn't want to acknowledge, which was it wasn't nearly as easy as they thought it was. And then the returns start to come in and You know, one of the white folks says, well, of course Kentucky went for Trump. I mean, that's where all the racists live. And Chappelle's character says, really? All the racists live in Kentucky? Is that right? You know, and he's like, well, of course. And then returns keep coming in and they get Vermont. You know, Vermont goes for Secretary Clinton and the white folks are all excited. Well, Vermont. And Chappelle says, oh, snap, with their four electoral college votes, that's that's really going to make a difference. And then the returns keep coming in, and finally, when it's obvious that Trump has won, Chris Rock's character comes in, and the white folks are like, this is the most racist thing that's ever happened in America. And Chappelle's character says, yeah, you know, my great-grandfather told me about that, but what did he know? He was a slave. In other words, (laughs) 
the point of this sketch, right, which was brilliantly conceived and written, was to say to white folks, y'all got knocked off stride by this because y'all actually didn't know the country you lived in. And people of color always knew the country they lived in. And if we had been listening to them, maybe we could have kept it from becoming the country that it is. But we didn't want to listen. We didn't want to listen and we didn't want to hear the reality of who we were. And so now they, Donald Trump is playing the same tune that everybody's been playing. You go back to the colonies. This is the oldest play in the book. Rich white people tell it not rich white people that their enemies are black and brown. It starts in the colonies. There's no such thing as white people in the colonies. European people didn't love each other. We hated each other. We spent most of our time killing each other. That was the whole history of Europe, was basically killing each other and looking for who the witch was. That's pretty much European history. I mean, honest to God, I'm just saying, like that, that's pretty much what we did. Oh, I need that water, thank you. Um, we just looked for the witch and kill folks. And all of a sudden in the colonies, there's no white people, you know. The Anglos hated the Irish, the Irish hated the Anglo, the Germans hated everybody, everybody hated them right back. The Northern Italians didn't even think the Southern Italians were Italians, right? There was no European unity, there wasn't one big happy family. But all of a sudden, in the middle of the 1700s, it becomes necessary to create this thing called the white race. Why did that happen? Well, because the landowners looked around and they could do math. And the landowners looked around and they realized, my God, man, we got all these African enslaved folks and these European indentured servants, and pretty soon they're going to figure out we're screwing all of them, so we better figure out something to get some of these people on our side, or otherwise they're going to take our stuff. So all of a sudden, you got these rich folks telling these poor landless peasants who are of European descent that they're better than even the highest black person. They don't have anything. They don't own any human beings. They don't own slaves, they don't own the shirt on their back, but you're gonna make them think that they do, like W.E.B. Du Bois would later call it the psychological wage of whiteness. The idea that you may not have much, but at least you're not black. You may not have much, but at least you're not brown. You may not have much, but at least you're not a person of color. And so, in effect, you extend these little advantages, you let white folks vote, at least if they're men, you let them own land, and you put the white men on the slave patrol, and you get rid of indentured servitude, and you tell these white men that don't have a pot to piss in, you're gonna be our eyes and our ears, you're gonna keep your eyes open on those black folks. You're going to tell us when they're trying to escape. You're going to be the buffer between us and them. These white folks are like, oh, okay, man. I'm on the team. Right? And all of a sudden, those rebellions that had begun to ferment in the 1600s between black and white folks working together start to dissipate because now these rich folks have convinced poor folks that they have more in common with rich folks than other poor folks. That's white supremacy. Fast forward to the Confederacy. That's what the rich white folks in the South, my part of the country, said. They all openly acknowledged why they wanted to secede. They didn't lie about it because they had no shame about it. We lie about it now. And John Kelly can go on national television and lie about it. And he knows he was lying. He knows full damn well that the Civil War was not caused by a lack of a willingness to compromise. He knows. But he's pandering to part of Donald Trump's base that believes that, that marinates in white rage and political anger. And so what's the reality of the South? They, my people told y'all. Like, we just told y'all. We didn't have any shame about it. We just stood up and said, Alexander Stevens, the vice president of the Confederacy, said, the cornerstone of our new government is the great truth that the Negro is not the equal of the white man. He said that. I didn't say that. I didn't put those words in his mouth. He said it. We got people lying about it now, but he was clear about it then. Every state that seceded told y'all why they left, and they told you it was about the desire to maintain slavery and extend it into the territories that had been captured to the West. They all said that. They gave no other reason, not one other reason but that. And yet here's the problem. Rich folks don't have any intention of going to war to fight for their own property. Rich folks not going to go to fight to protect their interest in slave ownership. They're going to get poor people to do that. Right? Rich people don't go to war. Rich people get poor people to go to war. Rich people get doctors to write notes saying they have heel spurs so they don't have to go to Vietnam. That's what rich people do. And so the rich came to the poor in the South and said, y'all need to go fight this war. And you would think that's ridiculous. Like, why would you do that? Why would you go fight to protect my interest in the ownership of human beings when you don't even own any human beings? Why would you do that? That's not your ownership. That's not your property. That's my property. Y'all not going to co come fight for my house? Like, if a military army invaded my block next week, I don't think I could call any y'all and be like, hey, listen, uh, there's an army invading my block. I have no intention of fighting to protect my own house. I'm going to sit on the back porch and drink mint juleps. 
but I would greatly appreciate it if you would come and defend my shit for me. Like, none of y'all are going to be like, I like that speech you gave in Denver. I'll be there in a minute. Like, none of y'all are going to do that. No matter how much you like what I have to say, you're going to be like, you need to defend your own shit. Like, that's what you're going to do. But the rich came to the poor and said, y'all need to do it. And the poor were like, okay. Why? Because the rich told the poor, if you don't do this, they're going to take your jobs. No fool, they already have your job. That's how the market works. If they have to pay a dollar a day for you to work on the farm and they can get a slave to do it for nothing, guess who got the job? Free got the job. In other words, the slave system actually underbid white labor and you'd have been better off joining with black folks to overthrow aristocracy rather than defending aristocracy. But once again, rich people told poor people, your enemies are black and brown. And now we got the same thing with the wall and the issue of immigration. We got somebody saying, oh, white people, your jobs will come back if we just build the wall. For real, is that how you think capitalism works? <laughs> you think that's how capitalism works? You just build a wall and it's like, oh my God, we got to give everybody a raise. They figured it out. <laughs> I think that's what every CEO is like. I hope they don't think about the wall. Because if they just think about building a wall, we're screwed. We're going to have to empty our profits to give bigger wages. No, that's not how ca capitalism is rooted in the notion of free markets that allow the mobility of money. And if you allow a system that allows mobility of capital, which is still going to be allowed, no matter if they can build a wall tomorrow, theoretically, and I say theoretically because if you've ever been on the border, you know that shit is not practical. Like, there are rivers and mountains and stuff. I mean, people that say you can build a wall on the American-Mexico border, U.S.-Mexico border have never been there, number one. But theoretically, you could build one. That's not going to stop capital from moving, right? It's not like the wall exists in cyberspace. And all of a sudden, you're like, oh, I'm going to move some money to the Cayman Islands. I'm going to move some money to the Cayman Islands. Hit send. Boink, it hit the wall. Oh, my God, what happened? <laughs> Damn it, I should have done it before they built the wall. <laughs> That's not how the wall works. If the capital can still move and the goods can still move, but labor can't move, if you allow capital to be mobile and goods to be mobile, but you don't allow labor to be mobile, guess what you just did? By definition, this is Econ 101. This is not complicated stuff, right? You just tilted the game in favor of capital and against labor every time. Labor would be better off to have a more militant and larger working class in this country fighting for better wages and living standards and benefits than trying to keep folks on different sides of an artificial wall. But, it's perfect politically because you can tell people that's why you don't have a job. Because those people have taken your job, right? Which I find fascinating. Took my job. Whenever somebody tells me that, that Mexican, that black person, they took my job. My thing is like, did you have the job yet? Because uh, <laughs> if you didn't have that job, that shit was not yours, <laughs> right? Like I might be more sympathetic to people who say that if like they got the call on Monday from the boss and they were like, hey, John. Congratulations, you're hired. And then like on Wednesday, the phone rings and they were like, no, just kidding, I'm giving it to Jose, goodbye. <laughs> like that would be unfair. That would be, I would be upset. Like I could get a little upset about that. That'd be unfair, it seemed cruel, right? But that's not what's happening. It's not like some dairy farmer in Iowa was waking up at four in the morning to go milk the cows, walking out to the barn, gets out there to the barn at four o'clock in the morning and some black dude hops up from behind the haystack and says, I already milked your cow, Mr. White Farmer. It's me, Andre from Detroit. I already did that shit. I took your job. That's not happening. It's not happening. I'll let y'all recover from that for a minute. But I get these emails from people, right? These white folks that'll write me like, I can't find a job because black and brown folks have taken all the jobs. Really, all the jobs? They took all the jobs? Why do they have unemployment rates that are double the rate of white folks? Where'd they take these jobs? They didn't take them far, <laughs> right? What are you talking about, right? But, but if they've been encouraged to believe that, if I've been encouraged to believe that's why, and I've got political elites that'll use that, that's the oldest play in the book. And so all of this stuff, the NFL stuff, all of it is about trying to tell white people who aren't rich, that their enemies are black and brown, that whatever problems they have in their life are about that. But let me tell you why that's a problem, other than just the obvious like, philosophical reasons why it's a problem. This is some dangerous stuff. And I'm going to 
be real serious about this because sometimes when we talk about racism, I think there's a tendency to, uh, for white people to assume that anything that might benefit equity, it comes at our expense. Right? So if you think of it all as a zero sum game, if you think of it all as any gain for them is a loss for me, then I totally sort of understand, even if I can't really totally get my head around it and I can't necessarily empathize with it, but I can understand why you would potentially be afraid of equity because you stand to lose something. So it's important for us to articulate a politic that explains why this inequity is actually unhealthy for all of us. Not just for black and brown folks, that's rather obvious why it's unhealthy for them. But why is it unhealthy for white folks? Because if we wanna actually create white allyship and actually create solidarity around a better criminal justice system, around a better labor market system, around better education, around better healthcare, all of that, we're gonna have to articulate some reason for why white folks should want to actually give up some of that privilege that we have. And see, the biggest privilege we have is the privilege of that obliviousness, that, that, that ability to be oblivious to black and brown truth. I don't have to know what you know. So I don't have to know what those ball players know. I don't have to know what black folks in 61 knew and 62 and 63. I don't have to know what black and brown folks today know. I don't have to know any of it. And for the most part, you can be ignorant and there's no consequence historically. You didn't have to know that stuff. And there was no real cost to be paid. But I'm gonna tell you something, right now, there's a cost to be paid. And if you're not clear on what the opioid crisis is really about, that's where I'm going right now. Because if you don't understand what this is really about, and there's nobody's gonna tell you what it's really about, because they don't wanna actually get into what it's really about, but I'm gonna tell you what it's really about. The opioid crisis, so here, first of all, the easy part, let's get the easy part out of the way. The easy part is, it's nice, isn't it, that we have sympathy for some folks with a drug problem all of a sudden? Because we didn't have that sympathy during the crack epidemic. We didn't have that sympathy during the heroin epidemic in the 70s. But all of a sudden, white folks are hooked on some painkillers and we're like, oh my God, we gotta get some rehab for these people. We gotta have treatment. It's a public health emergency, y'all. Well, it is a public health emergency and I'm gonna be treated like one as drugs generally should have been, treated like a public health issue, not a criminal issue. That should have always been the policy. But that is the easy part. That is the easy part. Anybody can tell you that, and anybody can, can say that, and it's obvious. It, it's not even remotely controversial, really, among reasonable people. But here's the deeper part. So, I mean, there's a lot of unreasonable people for whom I guess that is controversial. But that's the easy part, and I don't need cheap applause for the easy part. Here's what I need you to think about. I need you to think about why it is that this particular segment of America, white, non-college educated, working class, middle-aged white folks are so disproportionately being hit by this crisis because that's the group. A couple years ago, there was a study came out of Princeton from two economists that looked at death rates, mortality data from 1999 to 2013. So it's 14 years of mortality data. And they were noticing something really interesting in the data. So if you know, you know, typically in an advanced economy, mortality rates are generally always gonna decline unless there's a epidemic or a natural disaster or something horrible happens. Your, your mortality rates are always gonna generally be going in the positive direction, going down. Life expectancy is gonna go down, I mean, gonna go up and mortality rates are gonna go down. But from 1999 to 2013, even though that was true for every group, it was true for black folks, it was true for Latinx folks, it was true for most white folks, but there was one group of white folks for whom it wasn't true, and that was white, middle-aged, non-college educated, working class white people. During the same period that literally every other demographic saw their mortality rates decline, this group saw their mortality rates skyrocket. Over a 13 year period, half a million excess deaths. 500,000 people who died who wouldn't have died if their mortality rates had gone in the same direction as every other group. And it wasn't just like they were having heart attacks or like, you know, hardening of the, ardeni hard hardening of the arteries and strokes and stuff. These were people that were dying principally from three things. Opioid overdoses, cirrhosis of the liver brought on by heavy drinking, and suicide. These were self-inflicted deaths. They're called them deaths of despair in the media. You probably heard that terminology. When I saw this study, I remember thinking, well, this is fascinating because if the issue is just despair, 
If the issue is just I'm hurting and I'm in pain, then why aren't black and brown folks doing this? Because in every economic indicator, now I don't want to dismiss the pain that these white folks are in. They're suffering. Don't get me wrong. There are millions of white folks struggling in this country post-recession, have not come out of it yet. I'm not dismissing that. But there is no way of denying that black and brown folks are worse off. Black wealth, two-thirds of black wealth was wiped out during the recession mostly because of housing valuation that was wiped clean. So if it was just about pain and economic misery and anxiety and despair, black and brown folks would be doing opioids in those same numbers. They would be killing themselves. They would be drinking themselves to death, and they're not. So explain to me why white folks are having a harder time dealing with despair than black and brown folks. And when you think about that answer to that question, you have just answered the riddle of why privilege is a setup in this country. And you have just answered the riddle as to why white folks ought to care about issues of equity. Because you see, when the society tells you that all you got to do is work hard and everything will work out, because that's what we tell people. Luckily, most black and brown folks know it's more complicated than that. Most black and brown folks never had the luxury of believing that, but white folks did. Even those white working class men who worked in the assembly lines and the factories and the, and the coal mines, right? They had at least the belief in horizontal mobility. Right, which means what? My granddaddy worked in the mine, my daddy worked in the mine, I'ma work in the mine. Or my grandfather worked on the assembly line, my father worked on the assembly line, I'ma get a job with the union and work on the assembly line. Even those working class white men who struggle every day had the ability to believe that things would always at least be static, if not better. No black person in this country, no person of color in this country ever took for granted that they would have a job ready for them if they were just hardworking and willing to lift things. People of color always knew better. White folks didn't. We had the luxury of not knowing our country. So when black folks come up against a setback like the recession, that's just like a more extreme version of Monday, y'all. <laughs> Two thirds of black wealth gets white clean and it's like, yeah, that's pretty much how shit goes. Like, that's, you know, ridiculous and horrible, but we're sort of, that's, we know that, like that happens. And white folks have a setback and all of a sudden we're facing double digit unemployment and we don't know what to do with that. Because to us, we haven't faced that since the Great Depression. We have no idea how to even cope with that level of setback. See, James Baldwin said it best many years ago. He said, talking about black folks, he said, I don't mean to sentimentalize suffering. But that man who can never suffer, and he used gender-specific language, but we could say specifically, that person who can never suffer can never grow up, can never learn who they really are. Because that man who is forced to snatch his humanity out of the fires of human cruelty that rages to destroy it every day learns something about himself in the process that no school and no church can teach. He gains a sense of... He gains a sense of his own authority, and that is unshakable because in order to survive, in order to stay alive, he has to learn to look at the meaning beneath the words. And ultimately what Baldwin says is that when one is constantly surviving the worst that life has to bring, one ceases to be afraid of the worst that life can bring. And that's the difference. People of color are not afraid in this moment. It's white folks who are freaking out. We're the ones who don't know what to make of it. Whether it's white liberals who are freaking out over the politics of the moment or it's white conservatives and working class folks in these towns like Western PA who are freaking out about cultural change and they don't know what to make of that. Whatever it is, like we're all sort of in a system that we don't really understand and that's actually set us up for this moment. And now we're suffering as a result of it. And white folks are not gonna get the relief that they need in Western PA or Ohio or anywhere else in this country following the siren song of somebody that tells them that black and brown folks are to blame because they're not the source of that problem. That's not why they're hooked on opioids. They're hooked on opioids because that's the way you dull your pain, the pain that you never thought was yours to experience. And Donald Trump is just a walking, talking human opioid because he comes along. Because what is an opioid, y'all? Pharmacologically now, just scientifically. I'm not trying to be hyperbolic. I'm talking pharmacology. This is science. What is an opioid? Opioid is a thing that only has one purpose. It blocks pain receptors. That's all it does. It doesn't actually fix your problem. If you have a crushed disc in your back, they will give you opioids to deal with the pain. That will not fix the disc. You will need surgery for that. 
If you have cancer, they might give you opioids to deal with the pain. That will not get rid of the cancer. You will need surgery and possibly chemotherapy in order to deal with that. Opioids just block the pain. That's what Donald Trump does. He comes along and he says, I can take away your pain and I can tell you what the source of it is. I can't actually fix it, but just take me. I alone, he said, I alone can fix your problem. He is OxyContin with a heartbeat. And these people who have been led to believe that they were never supposed to experience anxiety this way eat it up because we don't know how to deal with setback. That's fragility, as Robin D'Angelo refers to it in the white community. We don't know how to deal with setback. We've never had to deal with it on this level. That's not to say that individual white people have not, but it's to say that an awful lot of white folks had the luxury, the privilege of actually believing the lie of America. And we'd have been a hell of a lot better off if we had just listened to black folks all along and listen to brown folks all along. Our privilege is now killing us. Our privilege of obliviousness is putting us in the grave early. So I think there's a real obvious reason why white folks ought to care about this. And I think there's a really important reason why those of us who are wondering what we're gonna do in this moment ought not lose hope. Here's how I know this. Because I know it's hard in these moments. You, you, you get discouraged and you wonder what we're going to do, and you wonder how we're going to do it. And the reason I said a minute ago that this is not new, that this is the oldest play in the playbook, it's not just because that's historically accurate. I need to tell you that because if you think that this monster is new, it becomes debilitating. If you think that this monster is a new monster, it's harder to fight. And I'm not talking about Donald Trump as a human being. I mean Trumpism as a political philosophy, as a political movement. And he's not the only one who's the arbiter of Trumpism. That's just the name that we can give it now. Right? If you think that it's a new monster, you don't know how to fight it. See, when I was a kid, I used, to, um, I used to have this way I could get out of nightmares. I was really good at it. Like, I'd have nightmares like every child, right? But I developed a, a, a practice that would get me out of the bad dream. I would just blink my eyes really hard. When I saw that monster chasing me, that's what I would do. I would, like, taunt him because I knew I had a plan, right? Be like, oh, you think you got me, but I got this thing you don't know anything about. I'm going to blink my eyes, and I'm going to be out of here in like 10 seconds, and the monster's still coming. You know? And I'm like, yeah, and I would turn around, and I would blink, and I'm out. You know? And I thought I was real badass for that at 10. But what would happen is every now and then, I would have a dream involving a different kind of monster, right? a new monster that I'd never seen before. And I would try the same technique, and it wouldn't work until I'd seen that monster like three or four times. And I'd learned that that monster really wasn't going to catch me. But when I saw it for the first time, I thought I could do the same thing and it wouldn't work. And I got nervous. I got scared about it. Same is true in politics. If you think that this monster is new, you get debilitated. If you understand it's the same, this is the same monster that's been under the bed for 400 years. Y'all. It's the same monster that's been in the closet for 400 years. And the reason that's important is if it's the same monster, then the stuff that folks did to fight that monster for 400 years will still work. Do you understand? And two weeks after the election, I remember going to, I was in DC, and I went to the African American History Museum, the newly opened Museum of African American History and Culture. If you have not had a chance to go to it, you need to go to it. Um, it's an incredible experience. And, and it's especially incredible, it was especially incredible for me in that moment because if you know the physical location of it, it's at the end of the mall, and it's literally 400 yards, 500 yards maybe, from the White House, from the back end of the White House. And it's, so it's sort of in between the Washington Monument and the White House over to the side of it. You can see the White House, and I know who's about to move in in a month. And I go into the museum, and you, know, you walk through it, and it's incredible. I mean, Emmett Till's original casket is in the museum, and Nat Turner's Bible is in the museum, and Lester Maddox's axe handle that he used to chase black folks out of his restaurant with is in the museum, and there are slave auction blocks in the museum, and there's this um, statue of Thomas Jefferson in the museum that is very deliberately positioned in front of a granite wall that is lit up with the words of his that all men are created equal, endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights among these life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Words that we know, of course, he did not mean because when he wrote them, he owned 230 people. But he wrote them in any event, and the museum is lit up words as they show you his visage cast in darkness and shadows, and behind him, between the granite wall with his pretty words and his own body, 
is another wall made of bricks, or at least what looks like bricks. And you get up on them and you start to get a little closer and you realize that these bricks have names on them. And if you don't know what the names are, you don't have to think about it too long. They'll tell you if you want to know that these are the names of the human beings that Thomas Jefferson owned. And so it's an incredibly powerful moment because you start to realize in the context of this museum, right, that in spite of this man's power and this man's erudition and this man's strength and this man's intellectual brilliance for all of his evil, the reality is folks fought him and they fought the system of which he was a part and they won. And if they were able to defeat what Thomas Jefferson, at least in part, stood for, which was the human bondage of other people, and they were able to defeat Bull Connor in 1963 and Jim Clark in Selma in 1965 and Lester Maddox in Georgia and the folks Orville Faubus in Little Rock, Arkansas in 1957, right? If black and brown folks have been able to stand up and defeat this monster, over and over, never fully defeating them, but knocking them down every time and every generation. If Bull Connor couldn't stop black and brown folks, if Jim Clark couldn't stop black and brown folks, if Thomas Jefferson couldn't stop black and brown folks, I'm fairly confident this guy is not the one. Thank you all for being here. I appreciate it.